no idea how an update works. <laughs> All right, cool. So you are recording. And Philip, do you want to make sure you're recording? Good to go. Okay, perfect. Hey guys, this is your High Fist here with the juiciest of all collabs once again. We are here to answer a fundamental question, guys. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? So I have the unstoppable force of Malas Tube, AP Canavan, and the immovable object of Malas Tube, Dr. Philip Chase, with me. So I guess I should have said Dr. AP Canavan as well. As I've always said, guys, they are true literary scholars. Uh, I'm here to learn from them. And uh, in AP's case, since we're discussing the fiends of nightmare, yeah, probably to mock AP a bit as well. But uh, AP and Philip, thank you so much for coming on board the Ruth and Bo channel once again. Uh, it's a pleasure. And I am definitely here for the AP mockery. <laughs> or I should say Apto Cannavalian, because any resemblance is purely coincidental, I'm sure. Right? Exactly. So yes, it is it is wonderful to, to be here, Ruth, and thank you so much. And <laughs> and yes, the, the character is definitely not based on me. Totally. Honestly. Guys, this is the Ruth and Bad channel, as you know. This these disclaimers don't work. We do not fall <laughs> for these illusions. We know exactly who it is. So uh, uh, the fiends of Nightmaria, guys, I think is uh, a pretty unique story in the Baukalane and Cobalt Broach sense, in the sense that while Crackpot Trail brought many of these disparate uh, threads and characters together, so that the Steg guys from the first story, the Chanter brothers are from uh, Worms, uh, uh, Apo Relent is from uh, the Healthy Dead and all that, this is where that gets intertwined with, not perhaps directly, but more in an indirect way, it gets directly intertwined with the Nehemoth storyline. These are the Nehemoth and I or whatever. Maybe there's some connection between the Azat and the Azat and I in that sense. Uh, the Azat and I are the ones who hunt the Azat houses or the force behind it or whatever. Anyway, so uh, I think it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, story in the sense that it almost feels like a culmination of where the story started at the beginning to where it is now. In the first volume, the cohesion between the stories could be a bit tricky because uh, the healthy dead seem to be set in some other uh, universe or some other timeline. Whereas here, uh, Worms, Crackpot Trail, and now uh, uh, Fiends, are, there's a proper chronology there. And this really feels like the third act in the second volume of the Baukalane and Cobalt Broach uh, uh, storyline. So I'm quite interested. Maybe we should start with Philip. Philip, what do you think about this particular story? Well, I think there's a nice carryover as well from Worms of Blearmouth in that you have Baukalane, your guy, your favorite uh, character in the Malazan universe, I believe. That's that's true, right? So- 200% uh, true. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I, I, I figured it would be, but uh, good to point, have that- Point of order. Point of order. Yes. What about Quick Ben, you traitor, you turncoat? So that's you, from the, you have turned on Quick Ben. That's from the ten big books. So Quick Ben, Tehol, Pearl. I love all of them, but that's ten big book stuff. This is Ericksonian material in Erickson's canon. The ten, my Ruth and Bad channel, guys. You know this. This entire channel is a ploy to get people to read the Baukalane stories. If I reach a thousand subscribers and ten of them turn to the Baukalane stories, I will quit doing ten big book stuff and just focus on the Baukalane stuff. Sorry, <laughs> Philip. Oh, no worries. Actually, I thought AP was going to say, what about Apto Cannavalian? But he didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I was saying something about Bocalane. Oh, yes. Yeah, so there, there's a carryover in terms of tyranny and Bocalane being a philosophical tyrant, uh, really more of a philosopher than a tyrant, I guess, because he keeps failing at being a tyrant. Uh, so I, I just, I love how you have him uh, discussing tyranny and, and it's particularly there's this is dialogue going on with uh, Emancipor Reese because he can't very well talk about it with Corbel Brooch, I suppose, uh, because Corbel Brooch is not very interested in, in governance in any form whatsoever, I think, uh, unless it involves dead bodies. 
Uh, so he has this interesting ongoing interaction with Emancipor about the nature of governance and how really the best form of government, I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the expert Ruth and Bad on, on, uh, on Bokelain, but it seems to me that he believes that a benign dictator, maybe not even benign, just a dictator, uh, would be the best way to govern things, because people are essentially dumb as toast anyway, uh, and according to his viewpoint, and they don't really know what's good for them. So you need a, a, an enlightened person like him to sort of step in and, and run things for everybody, which is kind of sort of what he's doing, but the results never seem to pan out very well for him, do they? No, and the interesting thing there is that, so in this particular story, that's his rationale. Whereas in the healthy debt, it's a completely different rationale that he uses. He's, and, and this is why I love him so much. He's, he's like this lawyer who is always willing and always capable in his conversations with Reese of twisting whatever his worldview is to suit the argument there. And I think many of us do it in real life as well, where, where we sort of at that moment, in order to make a pertinent point and in order to make an enlightening point, we kind of play around with our worldview. And that's exactly what uh, Baukulain does. I thought, I mean, we should get AP in here as well, because AP, in our, in our healthy debt discussion, you kind of went into some of these uh, political teams and leadership and tyranny and things like that. Uh, how do you think this is different from the healthy debt? Because in the healthy debt, we have a tyrant and Baukulain's going in, whereas here, the story kind of already starts with Baukulain as the usurper. He's already in power, isn't it? Well, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about this is the fact that I think all of us at one point or another have been been watching a sports team or have looked at how a film was made or how an author has written a book or looked at how a company is run and gone, if I was running this, I would have done these things and none of these problems would have happened. I know better than the people in charge. We, I am firmly convinced we have all thought this or felt this at some point. And what we've seen with Bocklin, and this would be my interpretation, Bocklin, he, he's very, very smart and he is always convinced he knows better than the people in charge. And we saw that in the Healthy Dead, that he was looking at this, this system and he was, wow, that is absolutely brilliant. I never would have thought of that. So now is his chance. He's going to step in and go, right, I am going to run this. I will show everyone how it's done. And this actually was slightly more complicated than I thought. Right, my <laughs> theory is sound. My theory is sound. I'm not changing my theory. The, the, the theory definitely works, just, just not in, in these particular circumstances. But there's nothing wrong with the theory. And I think that is is part of what is being explored here that we come up with all of these things we individually and we oh yeah if they, only they had done x and if i was in charge i would have done x and it all would have been fine and now we have someone put in that position he's been theorizing about it all the time he's had his perspective on it all the time he's commented on how other people have done things and criticized them for it and now he's gone right i'm in charge I'm going to do it the right way. And within a matter of weeks, it all goes tits up. <laughs> and my favorite part is that Cobal Brooch is the Grand Bishop. And the first <laughs> thing the Grand Bishop does is he eliminates all the other, uh, other, other priests and all that. Uh, Philip, how would you say this kind of ranks in relation to the other two in this volume? Because I feel like Worms and especially Crackpot Trail gets a lot of praise. The Crackpot is especially... But Fiends, because it kind of came out a lot more recently, in a sense, as in it's the, it's the last out of these in publication order as well. I don't really right. find a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, Fiends of Nightmare, yeah, that was awesome. Even though in some senses, it's a very, very strong story. Yeah, yeah. You probably can hear my dog drinking water there. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think this was probably, I think it's the shortest of the three we're talking about this time around. Uh, and I did find it to be just kind of the easiest to, to get into, maybe because I knew almost all the characters already. Um, but I, I do find it, it was a fun thing in, in that 
you, you have Bocalain eliminating all possible sources of opposition, including the artists and the writers who are all summarily executed or tortured. And we have a familiar group of artists languishing in the dungeons, <laughs> uh, people that we met in Crackpot Trail. So it was a, it's a wonderful carryover in that sense. And we can see that uh, those who were hunting uh, Bocalain and Corbel Brooch have, have uh, failed once again in, in achieving their, their goal. They're down there in the, in the dungeon as well. Uh, but you also have them eliminating the priests, like you said. They eliminated all possible, the Thieves Guild. They took the head of the, the head, literally, <laughs> of the Thieves Guild uh, as well. So you have all possible sources of uh, opposition, of dissent, have been crushed. Um, and still they managed not to, uh, to, to do so well. I mean, they, they do have the one general who's really gung-ho about going out. He's very um, xenophobic about this, this neighboring um, kingdom, the, the fiends of Nightmaria. And so he's all gung-ho and ready to go. And um, of course, his fate is, is a rather um, sad, uh, pretty pathetic one uh, <laughs> in the, the glorious battle that is the end of this thing, which is, doesn't happen because <laughs> his, his you know, speech meant to rouse the troops and all that, um, it sort of backfires uh, a little bit in the sense that they, they, his own troops, he doesn't realize that they all run away and he gallops forward and then his horse trips and that's the end of that. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed this one a lot. Uh, this was a lot of fun. It was an, for me, probably because of reading all the previous ones, this was the easiest to, to get into and to understand and, and have and fun with. I laughed at all of them, but all the hijinks going on down in the dungeons when you have the various parties. I loved the, uh, what are they called? The gang of five or whatever. Party of five. The party of five. Yeah. When they're really six all along and they, they don't, and of course, it very innocently, Corbel Broach just points it out at one point. He says, you know, you're actually, there's six of you. And they're like, no, we're, there's only five of us. So, um, and then at the end, they finally realize, and they are being followed by someone else too. We, we don't quite figure out who that is, I think. Um, or I think do they we? Don't, they, uh, I think they don't really count. The, the one who's counting doesn't count uh, uh, themselves. Herself. So they think they're a part. Yeah. With Corbel Broach, they have, a, they have a great scene where they're like, we're here for the head of the Thieves Guild. And Cobalt yeah, Roach like, just gives them a head and they're like, what is this? The head <laughs> of the Thieves Guild. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The, the, again, literalizing a metaphor. And yeah. it, it's that wonderful absurdism that, that comes through in all of these things. Because you, you can't do that joke in, in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. It, it wouldn't totally suit. And yet... When you when you get to that punchline, you realize Erickson has spent basically the entire novella building up to that one pun. And I I still I still really enjoy it and I still laugh. But in the previous books, remember we we've talked about how each time there there seems to be a core story that is being played with, that is being explored or parodied. Did you pick up on the fact that this is a role-playing group? That this is this is your quest party that goes on the dungeon crawl, and the, all of those adventure stories that we get in in all of these different franchises and, and explored in epic fantasy, and this is that quest party. This is a parody of the quest party and going because everyone has one skill. That is all they have. They all have one skill, one defining feature, and they're all terrible at it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And, and they're terrible in ways that you often find when you have bad die rolls, when you play these role-playing games, the, the knife guy keeps missing, the brute often has absolutely, I mean, there's a scene where he literally throws his teammates on the spears or whatever, and one guy's thigh is impaled, and speaking of those bad fates, uh, uh, Philip, we need to get to our main party from Crackpot Trail, because oh, yeah. I, I feel that AP and his colleagues... They, they really come into their own in terms of slapstick comedy because in Crackpot Trail, there are so many narrative layers going on and there's so much uh, richness and depth that's going on. I feel that the, the physical comedy aspect 
really comes into its own in this story as far as uh, AP and his friends are concerned, right? I mean, the broken backs, the gouged out eyes, the uh, bitten off uh, uh, tongues, and uh, yeah. AP somehow manages to, to get away. Uh, of course, uh, AP claims that he got away, and I'm sure he finished Erickson into believing that he got away, but I'm a postmodernist. I will <laughs> always believe that uh, AP is under the impression, and Steven Erickson, if you're watching this, please listen closely, right? Uh, the AP character is under the impression that he got away from the clutches of the indifferent God, but oh. there's actual, there, there is no real confirmation that that's the case. So, you know, I mean, if you want to play around with that literally and metaphorically, you know, you can, Mr. Erickson. So you're saying that, that AP is possessed by the indifferent God? Absolutely. And come on, I'm a postmodernist. You know, who can disagree with me? <laughs> oh, it's so wonderful. I mean, the, these guys are are familiar cast of characters. And you do have to say that that Apto Cannavalian is one slippery dude. I mean, his, <laughs> his, uh, he's, he is pretty clever, isn't he? At, uh, the, there's the one part where he pushes Port Brash. Fluster is the one who initially has the idea to pose like a statue. And then this <laughs> critic throws him under the bus. He he tosses him down to the ground to be bitten by demons, and and, and then he stands there himself, posing the whole time and and <laughs> complaining Philip, about his bad back. What a character, Philip! I what mean, was even more hilarious for me was you know sometimes when you and AP do your collabs, there's uh, some kind of bad connection, and AP just freezes. It's like I I I was literally <laughs> imagining AP stuck in one of those freeze frame poses as that happened i literally imagined him doing the uh thing as he stood there that was so funny i i i enjoyed reading this book uh preparing for this uh conversation because there are so many little jokes there that we can interpret into whatever we want ap i'm sure you're enjoying this conversation oh yeah oh, oh yeah this, this is a delight um because i'm surprised that neither one of you have mentioned the moment where when when faced with everything going on, Apto Cannavalian grabs the um, the the female character, yeah. brings her, and then closes the door on everyone else. Oh, we were getting to that. We were getting to that. <laughs> I yeah. was getting to that. I mean, the use of human shields. I was just getting there because and and he does he he does this to Brash. He does this to the lady, and he becomes a lot more because in Crackpot Trail there's still the depth of the artist and the critic and there are those conversations and the mutual respect we spoke about between him and Flickr and him recognizing that there's something more to Flickr and all that. Whereas here, the AP that we see in this story is much more of a sniveling, coward, <laughs> villain. And, and, and he sort of, I mean, uh, uh, there, there's, there's another uh, scene right at the very beginning where he's antagonizing the chanters at the beginning and he's like, oh, listen, Fuck you, I'm rich, you guys aren't. All these artists pay me big money, so I'm just going to use that money to get off. I have a villa, which I'm now going to use to bribe the executioners. And as it goes, he, he's kind of like, hmm, maybe I'm pushing it too much here. Maybe, maybe this a bit too much. And immediately, he does a 180. Immediately, he's like, oh, we're all a team. We've got to stick together. We've got to do this. Uh, yeah, what yeah. a slimy guy. He says, oh, I, actually, I really love you. He starts kissing Tiny's ass. Um, yeah, I mean, does he, he probably doesn't even have a villa, I'm guessing. He's just making it up, right? No, no, he does. Oh. <laughs> in the book, not in real life. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, I will say, um, for, for anyone out there who, who thinks it's a good idea to become friends with authors, um, <laughs> There are a couple of life lessons that you, you can learn from this particular episode uh, in that, yeah, you might be friends with the authors, but they, they are going to rip you apart mercilessly every, every time they write something, because, you know, you're just fodder for their imaginations to tear apart on the page. Yep. Critics beware. <laughs> But that Greek stuff isn't, isn't even there here, right? Uh, that's just touched on here and there. Here, uh, the AP character, like I was saying, that, that complexity is all reserved for Crackpot Trail. Whereas here, he actually turns into a Baukele. There are no wholesome side characters in any of the Baukele stories. It just doesn't happen. 
in crackpot trail it almost looks like we get a wholesome character one of uh, that guy's fans her name's uh, gush or something like that and it turns oh. out that she's the one behind the death of like 600 of that guy's followers and blah 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 and it's like ah oh, no not her either so there are no wholesome fans and in fiends uh, uh, sorry uh, wholesome side characters and in fiends just look at the way the chantra brothers i thought became a little more interesting here because uh, while their three stooges routine was funny in crackpot where tiny says something major crease uh, flee says something here there are all of a sudden there's a uh, uh, dissension there it's 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 almost as if there's actual character uh, development and it's all caused by these artists and critics who are with them these guys are getting tired he keeps saying uh, one guy keeps saying i, I want to kill the critic and the other guy is like no i want to kill the critic uh, uh, ap you really uh, you created character development in the chantra brothers and i think that's a that's a metaphor for how you sort of helped erickson uh, improve on his characterization work and all that uh, over the ages ap there's a powerful message hidden there um would the would the powerful message be that everyone in the world can unite against critics that they hit <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we must note that the critic comes out the most unscathed, except for that dodgy back, I suppose. But... Well, he keeps saying he has a bad back. There's there's yeah. no actual evidence for it. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Th in fact, there's a lot of evidence that he's lying about it. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I would help you guys, but oh, my back. Oh, so sorry. I can't pitch in and fight these demons with you. Yeah. And he then takes off and they're like, oh, where, where'd that guy go? He weaves through them and he takes off and he's like, ah, they all expect me to go up, but that's not what I'm going to do. That's not what my 9,000 IQ tells me to do. I'm going to go way down. And and you know what? So at the at the very end, there's almost like a bomb that goes off, I guess, the uh, the mouse uh, successor to yeah. Baukulain, where even the uh, demon prince... Uh, uh, I want to get your thoughts on the demon prince guy because... Uh, as I was, I, as I mentioned in one of the other videos, I'm a big fan of Erickson's portrayal of demons and the fact that they have this complex society and that they're very human in that sense. And I love how the commoners among the demons have a different way of speaking and the royals among the demons have a different way. Of, this guy is very much like the twins in Reaper's Gale, the demon uh, prince twins that we see in reaper's gale they have this unique uh, way of talking and he, he's literally like ah fuck you fuck you which we don't really get uh, he 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 uses the modern sort of uh, uh, he uses modern phrases like that so what did you guys think of uh, what's his name uh, flays all men flogs uh, uh, i come uh, what's his name philip you're the name guy you promised oh, us oh god it, it, i think it does begin with flail right F flail, flail some flail all limbs yeah, it, there's a longer version, but we're going to have to go with Prince Flail, Flail unless AP yeah. uh, conjures up the name there. It's a uh, funny name. So, yeah, it is funny, uh, as all these names are. Yeah. But yeah, no, the, the demons in here are, uh, of course, this is Bokelain's specialty, and we get to see a little bit about how he relates to his, his uh, I mean, the demon's not happy to be summoned, and I love how when he summons him, he has Emancipor Reese assist him. <laughs> And Emancipor has to stand at the very ed edge of the circle and not move. And of course, poor Emancipor gets these itches, um, you know, on his butt and, and, and he gets, <laughs> he's trying to, he's fidgeting and you have Bokelain, you know, uh, constantly saying, oh, what is, you know, clearing his throat, <clears throat> you know, he's, he's, poor Emancipor in that scene is just, that, that is some really great stuff. I was just laughing out loud during that moment, but uh ap you're about to say something well it's it, one of the things i i love particularly about that summoning scene before we talk about uh prince flail their limbs is if you're ever just, if you're just standing there and you know you can just stand and you can stand perfectly still nothing wrong you could Unless do it there's for, a cat hair on the circle i know but you you could do it for 10 15 you could probably stand there for half an hour as soon as someone says you cannot move and you cannot make a sound. That's when you go, oh, oh, well, now an itch has developed. And it's that weird psychological thing that we have that you can do it perfectly naturally and perfectly normally. But as soon as someone says you have to do it, that's when it all goes to hell. 
But if you notice, uh, Prince Flailer Limbs says, and I don't want any of those little, uh, little tiny demons that you painted because one of them tried to crawl up uh, into, into my, my bun, butt. Bun hole, I think is the term. Bun yeah. hole. Yeah. And of course, that's what Emancipor has been feeling. <laughs> and he's, so there's this subtle indication that perhaps that might be happening to him. Yeah. Um, and then the, the whole thing with the demonic mouse. And if I don't know if you recall uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, hmm. but the mice were the super intelligent, what was it, fifth dimensional beings? And, you know, that's what we have here, that there was this super powerful um, demon mice. All of these things. But what I... Uh, I love that point that that Ruthen came up with there that the the demon prince speaks in the vernacular, whereas a lot of the other lower demons have a much more formal register, which is of course the inversion of what we would see in Shakespeare with the elevated noble language and then the the uh, vernacular being used for the lower caste or uh, lower class characters within whatever story. And we're so used to seeing that elevated language for the nobles standard language or normal vernacular for uh, normal characters and it's the inversion here because their society is it's just as complex but it is different to ours so it's been flipped and the fact that he is so familiar with Bockland and it's not again Bock yeah I was having dinner across from that demoness who's really sexy and again but yeah. and you just get this sense of like, he is so fed up and one of the one of these days, Bockley, one of these days, I, why I ought to. Yeah. And he's holding a wine glass and somebody's thigh, right? Like he was. Yeah, out yeah, yeah. Plate. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a priest of Decembre. Uh, he's, he's, he's <laughs> eating a, a priest of Decembre. And he's even like, oh, I was with that concubine. And I remember the conversation that uh, Shadow Throne and Apt have, either in uh, House of Chains or Midnight or, or The Bone Hunters, where he mentions that she used to be a concubine to a powerful demon lord so i'm just the i'm just assuming gets... is it wasn't she a concubine to some demon lord I, yeah i think it's in dead house gates okay okay was it that early though uh, yeah. maybe okay maybe it was that early so i think many of these uh, i think demonic royalty in general uh, i mean they 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 like their 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 concubines uh, i guess and and even says listen uh, you're not going to do these humiliating things to me and baukalin was like no that was just for you to know who's in charge here because Baukalane still Baukalane and even when he summons this extremely powerful demon lord which I thought was a great contrast uh, to his scene in Memories of Ice because in Memories of Ice he has a great conversation with Quick Ben where he's like the geish on the Syrian demon's collar Quick Ben undoes it and it attacks him and Quick Ben jumps away and Quick Ben's like but what would you do if you wanted to free one of your one of the creatures that you summoned and Baukalane's like I never free any of the demons that I've summoned because they're just tools and here this happens I'm assuming after Memories of Ice because in Memories of Ice uh, Reese has been with them for about three years and here if I'm not mistaken that's later on so maybe that's some kind of character development for Baukalane I don't know maybe I'm just uh, sort of uh, uh, scrapping for scraps here but I do I, I did feel that that was an interesting observation that uh, Baukalane is no longer the guy who just uses the demons as I mean he's still the same guy but at least there's some sort of uh, exception to the gauge that he has because this demon lord later says I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here and they have history so I'm assuming sort of they, they've sort of he's let it go before well there, there's also the thing that this is a, a, a demon prince it's mm -hmm. not a regular demon. So maybe Bocklian isn't quite capable of binding him the same way that he's he can capable, bind him. He's capable. <laughs> I mean, in, the, in, in Worms, when that thing comes out of the cookie, he says, you're free to go and please give your master my compliments. So I'm assuming that that thing has some kind of prince or leader, some kind of another demon prince or leader. And he was like, maybe it's the same guy. Maybe it's the same uh, uh, flail, whatever. But come on, AP, he's more than capable of doing that. All right. But we have to say, though, that what does Prince Flail actually accomplish during the story? 
Not much. He only appears again at the end, right? Uh, where he has admitted that he tried to take the throne and realizes that that would be a bad idea. And he even warns the others, uh, you don't want to do that. Of course, they don't listen to him and everything explodes. So did he actually do Bocalane's bidding? He did not find the indifferent God who's been running around uh, using other people's bodies, uh, <laughs> particular parts of their bodies, especially overusing them. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how specific we want it, to be it, about it, that. It sort of uh, it takes over one of the demons as well, right? Because there's a ape-like yeah. demon that can't stop uh, 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 masturbating uh, either. I thought that was funny. I mean, come right. on, it actually has masturbating demons. How much funnier can you get than that conceptually? Come on, to the point where it falls off. I mean, that's pretty. Uh, yeah, I I don't think anyone's ever done that before. I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and that, at least that's he what didn't I'm blind. I was going to say, at least he didn't go blind. <laughs> that's right. And 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 there's there's the great scene where the party rushes into it, and it just comes all over the big brute uh, frontline fighter. Because usually oh. in these D and D parties, the defenders or whatever class you want to call them, their job is to absorb all the damage. And that's what they do. And obviously, in a situation like this, that guy's job is to be a screen for all that uh, demon sperm. And the other character's like, oh, I don't want to wipe it out. What if I get pregnant? There's no way I'm going near that. And then the other one says, the only way you'd get pregnant is if you wiped it off with your crotch. So... <laughs> And then she actually uses her what her water canteen or something. To, and the only water drink. canteen she had for her it was for her it was for her to fucking drink, and now she yeah. has to use that to splash it on but, this it blind idiot. But yeah. remember, she's the only one in the party who has been equipped for anything. She had the healing potion. She had yeah. the water. She has everything that they need. Whereas everyone else is absolutely inept. The guy who's meant to be dual wielding knives only has one knife and every time when they get into combat he doesn't he doesn't will it he throws it and then someone has to go and get it for him the other guy had a rope that he gave both ends to to someone else to hold and then walks off everyone in that party is the inept dungeon crawl party yeah and, and it's just uh, that was one of my favorite sort of parts of this is that they are just bad gamers bad role play gamers that the bad characters who they sucked at rolling up except for the heavy except for the the tank because yeah. he is he's massively strong and incredibly short-sighted and right. he's he's really dumb really stupid and and then it turns out no he's not He's been drugging himself every day so he won't inadvertently reveal all of the secrets of the secret society that he used to be senior in. And now that he's sobering up, he's actually coming round and he's he's actually quite smart. He's eloquent. And, yeah. And he's gonna have a lot of time to think about those secrets because they have where they end up at the end, you know, in, in uh Bocalane's little warren there. I, I imagine they're gonna be stuck there forever, right? Um, that that we Bokalin has said you can only put stuff in and you can't stay, take stuff out. And that's where all of the gold has gone because he doesn't care about wealth. But yeah. he's been taking it from everyone because, yeah, <laughs> I don't want it, but I don't want them to have it. That's yeah, even the one among. Go on. Sorry. Go on. Go on. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, even the one among their party, the, the gang of five or six or seven or whatever it is, even the one who seems competent because she's actually brought water and, and whatever else, she's the one who keeps walking into walls, right? I mean, she's the one who uh, is, is uh, cross-eyed, I think. And she's, she's cross-eyed, so she's seeing two of everything. Two of everything. So she's... she thinks they're the gang of 10 the whole time. <laughs> and, and that's why she keeps saying that there are two doors at the end and they're both ajar. Yeah. And it's yeah. why she keeps hitting off both walls because she's trying to follow both paths. Yeah. And it, sometimes I'm at a loss. <laughs> I, I was I was just going to say that, that the, the whole holding the goal thing is such a to hold move. And that is really, I mean, in, in some senses there are, I mean, here's, I'm going to stretch myself anyway, but uh, here goes. In some senses, there are many parallels between Baukalin and Tehol in the sense that they're both 
hyper intelligent people with little love for routine and methodical stuff and they're all about the exp the intellectual experience of life in their own way and as soon as he said oh yeah i mean i'm just holding the gold right because of course his his argument is that because he believes that the ultimate economic model is that all the wealth in the world is funneled into one particular channel that channel of course being uh, his carriage but you don't really see him uh, using it and even here his sort of his lack of materialism reminds me a lot of tehol as well there's this funny scene where the ambassador of the friends comes in and he's like oh we have uh, 40000 soldiers a uh, 1000 uh, whatever a 100 trebuchets uh, blah 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 and baukle and jesse so so i assume there's uh, there's no chance of uh, a peace treaty and and the ambassador's <laughs> like no way and baukle's like ah oh, that was just my personal curiosity emancipator get the carriage ready he doesn't skip a beat <laughs> the the idea of them losing this kingdom and just riding off into the sunset what a great inversion of the trope of riding off into the sunset where it's usually done by the hero and it's done after a sort of a glorious battle or some kind of redemption or whatever these guys always ride off into the sunset but they are the villains and they are riding off with a trail of destruction behind them and but one of the inter- he does do it after a battle though because all of the undead and everyone all over the place in the city is like oh, i'm going to have to cut a way through this so he brings out his sword and has to clear the way to get the carriage through yeah and reese is like a broach broach flew away broach uh, i mean b- because cobble broach uh, turns into a crow and flies away because his creations as you pointed out in one of the earlier videos uh, philip were, were useless they get uh, ripped apart immediately and baukelens like listen cobble broach knows that i am more than enough to handle this and even later he's like the souls that have Im- the demon souls that i've imprisoned in the sword they aren't happy because uh, uh, the the uh, the zombies or whatever just uh, fled when i started uh, uh, cutting him up before i forget that scene of that general who then gets killed by all the arrows what a contrast to someone like uh, a brookelian from memories of ice where it's a similar fanatical minded guy marching into death a uh, marching into sure death there's absolutely no way he's going to survive and yet there the same thing happening to him just being cut down by arrows and outnumbered and all that is so powerful and noble and and sort of uh, moving whereas here it's the fl- it's it's the same scene it's the same death in many cases except here it's just hilarious <laughs> yeah it is that's an invert total inversion there back to the the ending though with bokalane and um I would love to just talk a little bit about his relationship with Emancipor Reese because it's so evident in that scene how Bokaling needs Emancipor because he has to have an audience and I, and I I might have said earlier Corbo Broach isn't it he is he is something else he's his partner yes but he is not somebody cap- that is capable of understanding bokling the way bokling would like to be understood he needs an emancipor along with him and you get all this history as well with bokling revealing to emancipor that there've been lots of man servants and he's had to kill them all uh because of one thing or another and emancipor is visibly getting more and more nervous about all this but but it's interesting because he needs a sounding board and it can't be corbel broach cuz corbel he doesn't care about any of that stuff but he has to try his theories out on somebody so emancipor plays a very important role here in being yes he's us he's kind of the terrified viewer um who's forced to view all of this craziness uh he's the reader in a way we were sort of in his shoes more than anyone else's but he's also a necessary component there so it's not a partnership it's really a a, a triangle there uh where emancipor is much needed because bokling needs even if it's just one person he needs an audience he is the kind of person who needs an audience because he has to try out all of his thoughts about tyranny and everything else i mean he emancipor is his sounding board there right yeah i think the conversation they have uh, uh, where he says that is probably the end of worms 
where they where 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 they reveal that and even here it it it's almost become a running joke now where the final scene of Baukrain is always him educating Reese on something and there's a yeah. strange mix of terror and sort of this touching bond that forms between them <laughs> even in the climax here where Baukrain takes off the sword and he's like oh, I'm just going to cut through this army or whatever Reese is like come on do it quick just just do it mm-hmm. And Baukalin yeah. turns to Reese and he's like, "Oh, I mean, you're, you're, uh, uh, what's with this sort of uh, refreshing self-preservation?" Because Reese doesn't really go into self-preservation mode uh, around Baukalin, especially when we consider all the things that Baukalin makes him do. But when Reese does turn or go to a sort of self-preservation mode, Baukalin admires that, and Baukalin actually finds that refreshing. He finds it interesting. Yeah, but and of course, one of the other running gags is. Oh, the, the horses may scream, but they're used to it. The the horses will be on fire. Oh, but they're used to it. And it's the fact that Emancipa Reese has gone through all of these things. And we have seen him um, change as a character, although they're, all the core traits are still there. That relationship with Bauklin continues to evolve. And it's it's slow and it's nice. And it's, it's not spelled out to you. They just are more relaxed with each other. So in the scene where... Uh, the sitting at uh, the reception and Emancipor is just drinking the wine. Like Bocklin hasn't said, and you may have a glass of wine, uh, Emancipor. Like he's just sitting drinking. This is one of the, they've become more relaxed around each other. They've become more used to each other, which I, I think in this relationship does not bode well for his future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what do we think? What do we think about the, uh, the ambassador? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and the the <laughs> explanation, the explanation for why all of this has come about. Uh, it's it's once again just f- a, a funny way of showing us an example of state propaganda, where these these right. sort of these mistakes are immediately capitalized on. It's kind of like how uh, some people say that governments want you to believe that there are aliens and that there are ufos because once you have that theory in your mind it's easy for them to conduct all kinds of experiments with alien craft and and drones and all that because you automatically assume that it's uh, some kind of uh, alien uh, whatever the the they immediately they are happy with being known as fiends and we find out that even the nightmare thing was like an invention by them right the the only reason they have it is for them to sound more unpleasant to any outsiders yeah yeah i mean he's supposed to be the monstrous other right he's presented as this freak this you know amphibian like you know uh creature and his name even awful denith flatrock you know, uh, is is kind of an unwieldy, sort of weird sounding name. Uh, and But in a way, he's been sort of outfoxing everybody the whole time, hasn't he? And he is, in a way, uh, kind of a sympathetic character at the end because they, they he knows that they've been, they've been made into the monstrous other, that the fiends of Nightmaria, this is all propaganda. This is all um, otherizing and, and xenophobia and, and all of that. But they've actually known it all along and they prepared for it and they've had their army on the way. So they've actually, so this ambassador has, in a way, he's outsmarted Bokaling even because, right? And I he's mean, the freak. Well, yeah. Well, it's, I, I don't think it's a, he has outsmarted Bokaling. Bokaling has outsmarted himself. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and that's the thing. It's because the, no one thought to go and speak to the ambassador. Yeah, the, the ambassador is sitting there, and why is he there for this uh, ostensibly xenophobic nation that doesn't want to to talk to anyone? They don't want anyone coming in. They have their trade caravan routes. They have their trade ports where you're allowed to stop and trade, but you're not allowed into their their country. They are very isolated. That's how they like things, and so they give themselves a scary name, Nightmaria, and they are the Fians, um, because. But it looks like the word fiends, so everyone assumes the worst. And <laughs> because this particular ambassador had a skin condition and a problem with his tongue and a cleft palate, right, and right. he had a problem with his jaw, and 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 they went, well, to be honest, we don't want you around here, uh, so we'll send you to one of the places that we we don't like. 
and you can go and sit there. You won't bother us anymore. You'll uh, be a visual symbol for how scary our nation is. So his own culture is actually horrendous to him. And he mm. makes the best of it. He yeah. gets access to the library because he goes, you know, if I'm going to be here, I, I'll go in at night and I can sit and read whatever books that I like. And it means that I can avoid the um, the sun, which will dry out my skin that I have to keep moist and all of these sorts of things. He's actually quite a genial, nice guy yeah. who yeah. Uh, can eat an entire kitten by dislocating his jaw. But that aside, um, <laughs> we he as a as a character is absolutely fascinating because again it's this idea of the projection of the monstrous other and instead of anyone speaking to the ambassador it was like no no we're going to use this as an excuse to do that instead of talking it out and ultimately then it's when it's revealed that yes their southern army is that large and that's when, you know, Balkan says, oh, I suppose a uh, peace treaty's uh, out of the question then. And oh, now you want to talk that you declared war on us. You did all of these things. I have the, the official declaration of, law, of war from my king, because, again, no one thought to speak to the ambassador to sort things out. Diplomacy wasn't even tried because you're doing it for the sake of tyranny and they're doing it because pff, they're just going to wipe you out sack the place take what's worthwhile and then go back to the mountain fastnesses again yeah erickson even That's... gives us a hint there's an internal monologue with the ambassador where he mentions that nobody back home likes him but we just yeah. don't put that together there's an even bigger hint than that look at the messenger at the beginning he is not described this way right and the uh the hostler the uh stable yeah, is is not described that way. Yeah, only yeah. the ambassador is. <laughs> yeah, that scene with the cat does give new meaning to the the word uh, hairball, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that the snakes follow behind, worshiping him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. sewer. Yeah. Uh, but one of my one of my favorite little tiny lines that has like almost no relevance to everything else is the fact that, um, what was it, the, the spider was dragging chasing the, the mouse. Or chasing, chasing the mouse. And it was just this idea of a spider chasing a mouse, which to me is very, <laughs> like how big was this spider? Yeah. Um, but so much of, of this, like the, for me, the, the party of five is the absurdest element of, of this particular story. And that gels with obviously the goings on of uh, the survivors of Crackpot Trail <laughs> and the continuation of that whole thread. The fact that the chanters, the whole story behind uh, the, the parentage of the chanters, when it's suggested really that it's actually Jagged and that's why they're so powerful. The fact that Tiny, for all that we, we have been making fun of him in these discussions, is a powerful necromancer. The yeah, thing yeah. that he says that he hates, um, like all of these revelations, there's complexity in it. It's it's uh, confusing when the torturer is killed. Yeah, and that's the he, funniest scene. He, he critiques how he is being murdered. Yeah. <laughs> you missed the, it. Was you should have done the other side. Cause, and she's like, no, I didn't want to kill you fast. I wanted to kill you slowly. And then he was and he's like, like, oh, no. that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. And how that, am I that, meant to poison you if you're not going to eat the food? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I ate bits. He's like, I ate tiny bits here and there. That to me was, I can't, I can't believe I didn't mention it because that has to be the funniest scene in the story to me. The, the, the murder of the torturer or whatever. And just the way he's almost, it's almost like a Monty Python sketch uh, where kind of you, you, you kind of keep attacking him and he's still alive and he's, he has some critique or the other to give uh, just before he dies. Uh, that was so awesome. And she turns out to be a weird, of course, she's a, she's AP's a human shield, obviously. And she also turns out to be uh, the, the stake guy's uh, uh, love Stake interest. Yeah. yeah, Stake Meyer, uh, uh, whatever the love interest. And uh, I like the fact that we never really get to know their fate because uh, hopefully they will be back 
hopefully we will see some sort of closure to many of those uh, stories and all that. Uh, I just hope Steven Erickson has my sort of uh, argument uh, in mind that uh, there's a very high possibility that the indifferent God is not quite so indifferent to AP's fate, right? So <laughs> I also love how we get basically one run in between these two parties, the, the party of five and the survivors from Crackpot Trail. And it's a really literal run in because you have the heavy uh, from the party of five just bowling over, including he Heine beats the shit out of them. He just bowl, like they're like bowling pins and he's like, boom. And, he, <laughs> and then, of course, Apto Cannavalian slithers his way out of that one, too. So, yeah, we I think we'll be seeing him again, won't we? For sure. And if I yeah. and if I'm not mistaken, he's behind the artist, as in the the critic literally hides behind the artist. Hides behind the artist, and he, and, and he 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 lets the artist get the brunt of the damage. And this fucking critic who's in the shadow of the artist right behind him is the one who comes out of it unscathed, while yeah. everyone else is just beaten up with the the artist loses his tongue. His tongue. The artist loses his tongue while the critic hides behind him. How do you like you're that? You, you're terrible, AP. <laughs> Erickson wrote it! I have nothing to do with this. But it's based on a true story, right? Yeah, I'm not buying it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do you guys have anything to add about uh, the Fiends of Nightmaria? I think we've given AP a hard enough time for now. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, and and again, it's uh, for for people who uh, just to go back to m my opening point about the the parody of the quest group, the parody of the these band of adventurer stories, and how they go down, and how there's always a problem that only one of them can solve. That once you notice that about this, I think it adds a, an additional element of humor to the entire thing because you're. You're almost trying to guess what the the next thing is going to be and how they're going to sort it out and the running jokes between them and then the character backstories being revealed and even things like the uh, the head of the thieves guild i still chuckle at that joke <laughs> because as oh, soon as it's it's even foreshadowed because there's a room full of just heads before any of this gets revealed yeah and yet yeah. When Corporal Broach does it, you go, you know, they, they've made the jokes about everyone being headless. They, there's been a room full of just heads. We've seen the headless undead wandering around. They're looking for the head of the Thieves Guild. And it's a literal head. Yeah. And arguing over their, their cut of the prize. Yeah. And you go, but it's a head. At the, at the beginning, they even mentioned that they've taken the head of the Thieves Guild. And I thought that's that's exposition which we usually don't see in Erickson's stories. Like, why would this guy mention, as soon as they introduce, they're telling each other, oh, they've taken the head of the Thieves Guild. And I thought to myself, but they already know that the head of the Thieves Guild has been taken. And so he's I'm, setting up for this joke. I know, but hang on a sec. Where are they meeting? They're in a bar. They're in a tavern. The quest group is meeting in a tavern and they're doing the exposition for the quest they are about to go on. Awesome. It, it's, and that's why it's there. And it sets the joke up as well. But that's what, if you just look at it, and then actually, if you compare it, the Gardens of the Moon and Krupp and Marilio and Crocus meeting up in the tavern, they are the quest group. And that's Ericsson playing with it in a, a, a much more a uh, serious way but here it is just played for laughs and it's a lot of fun and you you can almost imagine one of the games that that Ericsson and Esselmont and their friends would have run and, and played with with that level of absurdity yeah awesome awesome this is why I love having these conversations with you guys because the Baukalane stories are stuff that uh, I've consumed over and over again so it's always nice when I get to interact with people about it and they can point out things to me that haven't struck me before so that when I read it again and when I revisit these stories again, lo and behold, despite having consumed them numerous times before, I have a new experience now to look forward to. So uh, Philip and AP, Dr. Philip Chase and Dr. AP Canavan, 
rather. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for being uh, a part of this conversation and for coming on board this channel, as I was saying. It's been a huge, huge honor for me, and I hope we find some way to do something like this. So, Stephen Erickson, please write more about Clean Stories. Well, thank you so much, Ruth. And uh, th this, doing th this particular collaboration where we get to talk about some of the humorous stuff is it, it's interesting, it's informative, we get to do literary analysis, we get to talk about all of these different influences, and obviously I love that kind of stuff. But the genuine getting to laugh about it because these are funny books, and this has just been so much fun. And you say about you know, getting a different perspective. You're selling your non-Western perspective a little short there, my friend. This conversations like this are the whole reason I love literature I, to see things from every from different readers perspectives we all bring our own strengths our own perspective our own view of things and we all add to this sort of understanding of of what literature is and about the stories it creates in the back of our heads so thank you so much yeah yeah i just i would definitely echo what ap said and and it's interesting because it's a little surreal for me even because I thought months ago when I first heard Ruth and Bad that th these stories, the, the Boca Lane and Corbel Broad stories were among your very favorites. Uh, I just sort of, and I knew I wanted to read them this year along with AP. I thought to myself, you know, wouldn't it be cool to hear what Ruth and Bad has to say? Because I would learn a lot, I'm sure, from him. And indeed, here I am learning a ton from both of you guys. So it's been such a pleasure for me uh, and an honor to be on your channel. So thank you so much. The pleasure and honor is all mine, guys. Uh, so, guys, that's the end of our conversation. I'm sure you enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. I just hit the uh, pause button, right?